This interview was recorded on March 10, 2020. Hi, I'm Len Epp from LeanPub, and in this episode of the Front Matter podcast, I'll be interviewing Guy LeCharles Gonzalez. Based in New Jersey, Guy has over 25 years' experience in content strategy and marketing, holding many different roles at organizations from Writer's Digest to F&W and Digital Book World and Library Journal and School Library Journal, amongst others. A former National Poetry Slam champion, he is chief strategist at Freeverse Media, a strategic marketing consultancy for brands and businesses, and he is the project lead for the Panorama Project, a fascinating research initiative looking into the impact of libraries on their readers, their communities, authors, and the book industry generally. You can follow him on Twitter at GLaCharles and check out his website at loudpoet.com where you can find out more about him and his work and read his blog posts where he covers a variety of issues important to people with an interest in understanding with an interest in understanding the book publishing industry. You can also find the Panorama Project at panoramaproject.org and follow it on Twitter at panoramaprojorg. In this interview, we're going to talk about Guy's background and career, the Panorama Project, and address some of the big issues people are talking about in the book publishing industry world right now. So thank you, Guy, for being on the Front Matter podcast. Oh, thanks, Len. Thanks for having me. That's a, actually, I'm going to steal that bio. You kind of knit a few things together that I always have trouble with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I try to do. I try to do a lot of research for these interviews, and actually, it's, it's funny that this came up in a recent interview. But actually, getting the bio right is one of the hardest things sometimes <laughs> because people have their fingers in so many different pies. I always like to start these interviews by asking people for their origin story. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about where you grew up and how you first became interested in writing, and I guess uh, maybe how you got interested in poetry. Yeah, uh, so two separate stories. Uh, the, the writing origin, you know, starts way back as a kid. I grew up, uh, you know, was an avid reader, enjoyed reading. You know, that was the stereotype. I'd read the back of the cereal box. You know, anything that was in front of me that had words in it, I'd read. My uh, father worked for the New York Times. He was in um, advertising support for a long time. So the New York Times was a regular presence uh, in our apartment um, while my parents were together. So, you know, I grew up where reading was just a thing we did. There was nothing magic or special about it. It was just, you know, I was a reader. My parents were readers. Uh, my grandparents were readers. The writing came in, I forget the grade. I want to say it was third grade. We had an assignment um, and we had to write a short story. And I didn't and waited till the last minute and was like, oh, man, that this thing's due tomorrow. What am I going to do? So I plagiarized a short story out of um, a book of ghost stories that I had picked up at the Scholastic Book Fair. And there was it was a story about, I forget, it's one of the old, you know, urban legend classics, kids around the campfire, the voice in the woods. You know, today, any kid pretending that that was their story, you'd be like, are you serious? Come on. Um, but I changed the names. I handed it in. Teacher was like, hey, this is great. You're so creative. And I really liked the feedback I got from that. It's like, oh, wow, this is kind of cool. I'm going to write another book, another story. So I come home. I tell my mother about it. And she's like, oh, wow, that's great. And so I'm like, yeah, I've got some other great ideas for uh, stories that I want to write. And they're all stories right out of this short story a collection of ghost stories. So she's like, oh, well, tell me another one. So I tell her one, and it's the one about the uh, wife with the ribbon around her neck. And the husband's like, oh, what's with that ribbon? Why don't you take it off? She's like, no. And ultimately, one night he takes it off, and her head falls off. And she's like, I told you not to take it off. Um, and my mother's like, huh, that one sounds kind of familiar. I feel like I've heard that one before. And now I panic. I'm like, oh, shit, I've been busted. So I hide the book in my closet. And I go write a story of my own, which is not very good, does not get the same reaction that that first one did that wasn't mine. But that process uh, triggered two things was like, hey, the idea of writing is something I like and I particularly like the feedback you get. Um, but writing is hard. So if I'm going to go after it, I got to take this more seriously. And so that began a young lifetime of uh, thinking of myself as a writer, writing short stories. Um, in my early teen years, you know, I was famous for I would write whatever I was into at the time, which around then was James Bond and Stephen King. So like the James Bond books, Ian Fleming. Um, I'd write these variations on either Stephen King horror stories or James Bond type uh, thrillers where I was the good guy. 
whatever girl I had a crush on was the love interest, and the villain was the guy she liked, because it usually wasn't me. And so that became, and they, they weren't very good, but they kept me writing. What I didn't realize till many years later, the other writing I was doing that I never considered writing was uh, nonfiction. And particularly the peak of that was probably in 1986 when I was in high school, uh, I uh, ran my first fantasy football league. And back then in the 80s, you know, nowadays it's all online. It's easy to do. In the 80s, it was USA Today on Monday going through the box scores manually, adding up all those points for, you know, the 10 teams and however many players that was. So I started that league. I was the commissioner. And one of the things I did was self-published a weekly newsletter about the results. So every game kind of had its own match report. And I write them as if they were real games and not just collections of numbers from unrelated players. And so that was the first real instance of me writing in a nonfiction kind of way that I never thought of as writing. And actually was also my first experience in self-publishing, not counting, you know, I'm ignoring a whole comic book phase that I went through. That was a whole parallel track where I wasn't a good artist, but I drew well enough to tell the stories I wanted to tell in comics. So there's that whole underlying foundation of this uh, avid reader interest in particular types of uh, genres that translating into writing I'd like to do this experimenting with self publishing, but you know, back then having no idea that that's what it was called and in 11th grade, I got a job at the library. So that was my that was my first real job. My job right before that, I was a paper boy. So books, publishing media, kind of <laughs> from my first uh, time getting paid to do something. First as a paper boy, then I was a uh, page in the Mount Vernon Public Library for a year. And that's where I really got to discover the breadth of uh, what was out there beyond the genres I was uh, most interested in. Um, you know, explored the stacks, learned, you know, didn't learn the Dewey Decimal System, but learned where the interesting things were in the Dewey Decimal System. And so that really carried over into, the, over the teenage years into early adulthood, there was this belief that I was going to write a book someday. That was what I thought. I was a fiction writer. You know, I was writing these short stories. Um, most of those short stories in later years were attempts to start a novel that once I wrote the story in my head, I'd have, you know, 15, 20 pages of buildup and then I'd wrap it up in five pages because in my head I'd finished it. And so, you know, the self-discipline it takes to write a novel, I have so much respect for because I've never had that self-discipline. And that kind of segues into how I got into poetry. Um, in my mid twenties, the new uh, so Poetry Slam, the New Eureka Poets Cafe, was going through its kind of second wave of uh, popularity and notoriety. Um, I had recently moved back to the city. I'd been in the army for a few years. Came back to New York and had heard about the New Eureka Poets Cafe for a while. Finally went, uh, it was actually the Friday after Thanksgiving, the year of 94. Yeah. Um, went to my first show. It was a Friday night poetry slam. Bob Holman was the host then. Um, I forget who the poets were, but they were all amazing. Like I was impressed by the entire experience, the poetry on stage, the interaction of the audience. And at that point, it was purely um, an experience to enjoy. It never crossed my mind at that point that, oh, hey, I could write poetry. Um, that happened three years later in the most stereotypical way possible um, for a girl. Went through a breakup. I've got some terrible poems that I, oh, the New Eurekan, they, they read poetry there. I'm going to go read these terrible poems of the New Eurekan. And so I went to their Wednesday night open slams, read a couple of poems, um, one of them was halfway decent. Two of them were pretty terrible. But the um, the community there was very supportive, you know, unless you were just not so much bad from a craft perspective, but bad from a perspective perspective. Like, you know, if you were getting up there saying some purposely crazy stuff, then you might not get the community support. But if you were up there giving it a genuine effort or, you know, there was something authentic about, about what you were trying to say, the community was generally supportive on Wednesday nights. Friday nights was a little more cutthroat. That was the real competition. 
Um, but I lucked into a Wednesday night. The uh, the host by then was this guy, Keith Roach, um, who had taken over from Bob Holman. He saw something he liked about me and invited me to do a Friday slam about, let's say, I think I had about two months notice. So now I was like, oh, man, that the Friday slam is the real thing. I got to start you know, up in my game here and taking this writing a little serious. I'm sorry to interrupt, but could you explain a yeah. little bit about what a poetry slam is for those who, who, who might not know? Cause yeah, absolutely. Can't... Yes, and not as popular as it used to be. So, uh, yeah. So at its core, a poetry slam is it's a competition that's not meant to be taken seriously. And so poets have three minutes to get on stage, read their poem, um, over the years, different regions have adopted their own variations to the rule. But at, at the heart of it, you're performing your work. It's a single piece. You've got three minutes to perform it. And then you've got judges in the audience who are generally randomly picked by the host ahead of time. And they're going to score every poem from zero to ten, like gymnastics. Um, and generally, there's five judges. You drop the high, you drop the low, you add the three points, and you get a best of 30 score. And then, depending on the size of the slam and how it's run, there's either a couple of rounds or there's one round and best score wins. Um, and at its core, it's really meant to A, make poets a little more responsible for engaging their audience. It was partly a response to poetry in the 80s had kind of gotten very dry. Um, poets would get on stage, have their head buried in their book and read their poems like this and expect applause after they were done. And it was a painful experience that, you know, almost became a stereotype, but was more or less the norm. And so the Poetry Slam started in Chicago. It was a response to that. And that subculture kind of bubbled up in Chicago, started to spread. Um, there was a national, the first national Poetry Slam, I think was in 90, 91. And I think there was four teams. By the time I went uh, on behalf of the New Eureka in 98, I think there were 24 or 28 teams. I forget the number. It had grown pretty big at that point. And that's the year we won. So that's the, how I get to claim I was a National Poetry Slam champion. I was on the team for the New Eureka that year. And, you know, the difference between your local slam, which could be anywhere from uh, we don't take this too seriously, it's a fun night, to reasonably competitive the National Poetry Slam was kind of both of those uh, poles taken to their extreme. So this deeply supportive community, because at the end of the day, you know, four teams make it to the finals. So you better enjoy your experience there because you're most likely not even going to make it to the finals. Um, and then the hyper competitiveness of the teams that actually can, you know, make it through and make it to the finals. So it was a really intense experience that um, was rewarding both as a writer because people are responding to your work, but also, you know, some people weren't willing to recognize the artifice of it all. And, hey, don't take this too seriously. These are literally random people putting a number on your work. So you can buy into that a little too much and start catering your work in that direction, um, which, you know, Fast forward today, let's call that the corporate publishing bestseller model. Um, or you can be true to what you're trying to do, and you may not get a 10, but you may connect with somebody in that audience who doesn't have a scorecard in ways that are going to be way more important and longer lasting than getting that 10 and winning. And that, to me, is the you know more community-centric small press model. You know, just to connect the dots to publishing there a bit. But yeah, at its core, Poetry Slam was meant to be a way to make poetry more accessible and interesting beyond the audience that it had kind of contracted to by the 80s. Yeah, thanks very much for sharing that. Uh, not, yeah. not, not to digress, but you, you dropped uh, a line about having been in the army for a few years. Uh, and um, <laughs> I, I'm trying to put together the timing, but was that around the time of the Gulf War? I actually signed up in March of 91, which was, so the day I signed up, Desert Shield was happening. By the time I got out of basic training, Desert Shield was technically over because, you know, depending on how you uh, reference it, that was a very short war or it's a war that actually hasn't ended and is still ongoing. 
And I defer to the latter only because people who signed up uh, years later still qualify for the same ribbon I got for service during that period, because from the military's perspective, that period actually hasn't ended. You know, the names of the wars have changed, but that service in wartime, you know, basically from Desert Shield on, you have, the U.S. has been in some form of military conflict ever since. That's um, really fascinating, and it sounds like <laughs> we could have a whole other interview about that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, resist the temptation and and, and just just let it go. Uh, but thank you for sharing that. Um, and so you then developed a career, or perhaps in parallel to this. And you, I know I know you you um, you founded and hosted a poetry series in Union Square in New York City for a while. You did a bunch of other things, but you also ended up with a career uh, in in marketing and things like that. And how how did that happen? So uh, when I came out of the Army, um, I moved back to this area. Uh, initially, uh, moved back to Jersey, stayed with my father for a few months till I found a job. The, and this was back in the day where temp assignments were, you know, working as a temp was kind of a, a legitimate way to make a living. Um, so my first assignment was at a, a B2B directory publisher called K3. And it was in their accounts uh, receivable department. It was a one week assignment, whatever. Um, but it was the people were nice. They liked me. They had another opening a couple of weeks later in their circulation department, brought me back. And circulation is subscription marketing, basically. Um, back then, it was primarily direct mail. So I was brought in for a two week assignment. And on my third day, one of the three people in that department quit on the spot unexpectedly out of, you know, some drama happened there that I had nothing to do with, but it opened an opportunity because among her responsibilities was this one annual publication called Musical America, which was an old school physical directory of uh, concert and music venues across the country, basically a yellow pages of like opera halls and music houses and things like that. And she was the only one who knew how to use the database that uh, managed the subscriptions for that product. And it was about a month due from be, needing to be uh, active and ready to go. So I was at that point, what was I, 24, 25? Um, because I grew up, you know, with, you know, millennials are considered the digital generation, which I think is nonsense. Like I grew up in that transition. You know, I had an Atari 2600. I had a Commodore 64. Like I experienced that transition from typewriters to computers, from telephones to mobile phones. So I always think it's funny when people pretend millennials are the first generation with that uh, digital background. But I came into that role very comfortable with computers and in a department with two other people who were older, not as interested. All of their subscription products worked with a third party who managed the subscription databases. So this was the only one that had an internally managed database on a program neither of them knew. So I was like, hey, job opportunity. I'll take it. So I taught myself. It was called QuickFill. I think it's still around. Um, and it was basically a subscription management database program. I took that on in my two-week assignment, turned into a never-ending nine-month assignment before they finally hired me full-time. And in that process, I learned all about direct marketing, direct mail, uh, database management, analytics, tracking, all the things that allegedly digital marketing, you know, introduced and, you know, turned into magic bullets. All of these things are kind of the foundation of circulation, uh, old-school subscription marketing, direct mail. And that beginning was both my entry into publishing, my entry into marketing, and my entry into understanding that two things that I was personally really into could actually become a career, and that was media and marketing. And so we're, we're talking sort of mid-90s mid, mid 90s here, right? This would have been, came out in 93, this would have been late 93. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I always, I always like to when it, when when these kind of contexts come up, it's uh, always really interesting to sort of situate in the in the technology of the time when you know, the, right at that moment, uh, the World Wide Web was becoming a thing, uh, and so it was this interesting kind of collision between you know, very and I'm really glad you brought this up. Like, print wasn't unsophisticated. Right. 
<laughs> a lot of people like to think that it that it was and it was not um uh there was lots of very sophisticated marketing lots of very sophisticated processes some of them you might even regard as more sophisticated than the things we do these days because it involved physical things uh and that involves logistics and timing and 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 uh, you know other things like that that right. are really important challenges to face and i actually interviewed someone uh for the podcast a while ago who um had a, a similar sort of I mean, in the broad category experience with um, legal directories, mm -hmm. uh, at j just at that time, and and the transition from you know, those these things were really really important, and not just important but incredibly valuable to the people who used them. Uh, you can imagine if you're if you're if you if you're managing a band and you've gone to book gigs, like having a directory of like with places and addresses and names and numbers to call, like yeah. without that you had nothing. Um, and so. Uh, carrying on you now had this really robust kind of almost accidental experience that you fell into uh but then you went on and you you worked for uh things like poets and writers i'm just looking at your linkedin profile here mm -hmm. uh the academy of american poets uh and and this was all then you you know going into the um uh, beginning of the 2000s uh you worked as an advertising sales manager and marketing manager but you just skipping ahead uh you ended up being uh the, one of the the founding programming director for digital book world uh, and in 2010, I believe. Yeah, that was the debut of uh, Digital World. Yeah, I, I watched I watched a, a video of you online talking. I give I think giving the closing address at the first uh, yes. Digital Book World conference, mm -hmm. and it was the very day the iPad came out. So I bring that up uh. and talk about. Let's <laughs> skip ahead for a bunch of technological revolutions happened, but mm -hmm. but there you were organizing a conference or, or you know helping organize a conference around digital books, just after the Kindle came out, just when the iPad came out. Uh, what was it? What was the atmosphere like in the publishing world at the time? So that was really a really interesting time because there was a segment of the industry, and I'd say probably a pretty large segment, to um, for more for worse than for better, who saw the iPad as the savior of publishing broadly, but particularly on the book side of the world. Uh, book publishers you know, really thought it was going to be a big deal. Um, our CEO at the time thought it was such a big deal that we had to actually revamp the entire second day of the digital book world schedule to block out time to put Steve Jobs's, uh, we streamed his address, introducing the um, iPad Stop, you know, they didn't schedule anything, stopped programming. It was like, hey, everybody gather around these TVs, free advertising for Apple and the iPad, which happened a lot in the industry, but it was one of the more egregious examples of it. Um, but there really was a lot of buzz around the iPad was going to uh, help turn things around for publishing broadly, and it was going to be particularly a big deal for Apple because finally, I mean, for book publishers, because finally there was a legitimate competitor to Amazon. Um, and I think, you know, Apple and Steve Jobs were very smart in how they approached different markets and basically got them to do free advertising for them. Um, so, you know, at Digital Book World, it, was, it had a lot of mind share, even though it technically wasn't on the program in any way. Um, a short couple of months after, I want to say it was two months in, and Steve Jobs did this um, update where what he said isn't what he put up on his slides. What was reported is what he said, even though on his slides was, you know, a not so much a contradiction, but Jobs worded it in a way that if you weren't paying attention and chose not to do any actual fact checking, reported that in two months, Apple was already the number two ebook player in the space after only two months uh, being out. And in fact, what his slides said and if you parsed what Jobs himself said, because it was really slick about how he framed it, for the publishers who were working with Apple on specific books, they were the number two. So it was a very nuanced spin that the media quickly just promoted as, hey, Apple, two months in, the iPad is a huge success. Apple is the number two ebook vendor um, in the country. Second only to Amazon, which was far from the truth at that point. Barnes and Noble was still a solid number two with the Nook. Um, but yeah, the, the ebooks and iPad and digital book world, you know, was digital book world was born partly from I don't know if you remember Tools of Change. Yes. 
So Tools of Change uh, was maybe four years in by the time Digital Book World launched. Digital Book World was born at the 2009 Tools of Change when our CEO, David Nussbaum, attended and left frustrated by the uh, doomsaying and negativity around publishing. Technology is going to kill the publishing industry. All these new disruptors are going to come in and legacy publishing is dead. Just lock it up. You guys are done. And our CEO left and was like, um, A, I don't believe that's true. B, even if it's possibly true, there's got to be solutions to, you know, we shouldn't just close our doors. There's got to be things we can do. And this program didn't offer anything. It made the presumption that, hey, you guys are done. Here's where the future is. So he came back and was like, you know, this is ridiculous. Where is the conference for publishers to tackle these digital challenges? Um, it didn't exist. And so finally he was like, well, then fine, we'll do it. F and W was had events, had a lot of experience in producing events, but they were a, a, a B two C uh, media company, books, magazines for consumers. They had no B two B footing at all. Um, I had B two B experience from prior companies, and I had started to develop my own kind of following, being just a critic of the media space in general. To this day, there are people who think they met me at Tools of Change 2009 in person. We only ever interacted on Twitter, and I wrote a couple of blog posts back when you know blogs were a lot bigger than they are today. Um, but I met people on Twitter via the TOC 2009 hashtag that to, to this day, they swear we met in person at uh, TOC 2009. So Digital Book World was kind of born from this sense of, you know, look, no question, digital is disruptive. There are going to be challenges down the road, but there's absolutely no way that there's not a place for quote unquote legacy publishers in this new world. And so the challenge is to figure out where those opportunities are, identify where those uh, threats are to see what can, uh, how we can overcome them. So that's how Digital Book World was born. And I initially was brought on uh, in the beginning, purely just to sell sponsorship space uh, because it was a new initiative. I was excited about it. And pretty early on, we got a lot of positive feedback from the publishing community that we were on to something. And I want to say in October, so we Digital Book World was announced in July 2009, and it was just a press release. Uh, September, we started having internal conversations about the feedback. And by October, our CEO decided, you know what? We're going to launch a full-fledged community around Digital Book World. So we're not just going to produce this one-off event. We're going to build something bigger around it in, in what then was the F&W community model. You know, media, events, uh, education, what whatever made sense for that particular community. And at that point, that's when I was uh, tapped to actually take it over and say, you know what, you're going to run this for my experiences with Writer's Digest, some other internal experiences I had at the company and helping drive some of our innovations. I was tapped uh, to be the public face. Shaskin was brought in to be the program uh, chair and actually do the first year. 95 percent of that program was Mike Shaskin. And it reflected Mike Shatskin's worldview, which was back then very big six centric and small, mid-sized publishers and anything outside of core trade were curiosities, but nothing to really be fully integrated because, you know, that was Mike's world. Big six publishers, that is a from his own perspective, those were that was his client base. So that's where the money was for him. Um, So what happened between year one and year two is a we realized if for this event to be what we want it to be, it can't just serve the big six because that's even based in New York, you're only going to grow so big. You know, we could probably hold an event in New York that was big six centric and top out at four or 500 people at the max. If we didn't broaden it to uh, also serve small and mid sized publishers to talk about some of the other challenges, not just be about ebooks, but talk about marketing challenges, talk about other channels, libraries, things like that. So that was the evolution between year one and year two. And at that point, I took over about 25 percent of the program and developed those kind of non big six uh, sessions and tracks. And between the two uh, conferences, produced a lot of webinars, you know, content became we were never trying to be publishers weekly and, you know, compete on volume. 
So in a lot of ways, I became the contrarian. I wrote a lot. I was one of the few voices who was always like, hold on, can we fact check one of these Apple statements rather than just you know reporting yet another you know huge spike in percentages or whatever? Um, yeah, there's there's a I mean there's it's there's so many threads to <laughs> threads to pull on there. Thank you for sharing all that and and for putting it so 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 um sort of compactly. But there's there's um so for example for people listening, uh, Mike Shatskin is a publishing industry expert and consultant who we've had on the podcast before. Um, he's uh, got a really good person to follow for I mean for you know industry analysis. Um, the, you mentioned the big six; it's now the big five, but these are the yes. big publishing companies. And one of the sort of uh, themes in discussions like this is that everything in book publishing in America is typically very New York centric. Um, actually, my co-founder, Peter, gave a talk about, about Lean Pub at Tools of Change in 2013 in New York. I remember being there at the time. Mm. It was very, very exciting. Um, but there was, I do recall, uh, you know, it being, there's this very, there's this very big tension between sort of technology and publishing, which is something that if you're in the, in the publish, book publishing world, it's, just saying that sort of like is a very overdetermined thing, um, but uh, there is this inherent tension, and 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 always has been uh, for some people, particularly the big six, which inherited this huge legacy industry based on print books, and the time that the times that you're talking about and the tensions that you're talking about were just huge, like earthquakes. Um, you know, in two thousand and nine was I I gather a sort of very tense tense year for the book publishing world. Um, things like, uh, the Kindle coming out just, I think in 2007 or 2008 or so, uh, was like something that people were, a lot of people were biting their nails about what, what was going to happen. Then, you know, Apple comes out with the iPad, uh, which was a revolutionary device in terms of like the, the things like that had existed before, but it mainstreamed yes. having a tablet that you could touch and download and read things on, including books. And so for, you can imagine the publishing world where like you've got huge investments in, the, in a, an industry that goes back centuries and all of a sudden people can hold this thing in their, their hand. And, you know, speaking of New York stories, I was, I think it was the next year I went to book expo America. Um, and there was one session on self-publishing, uh, and, um, guy headed by Guy Kawasaki. And, uh, one of the, I remember I, I always tell this story. I probably get it wrong in my memory, but there was this one packed session where there was, um, the CEO of uh, Overdrive, Steve Potash, I think. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the CEO of Simon & Schuster. I think the head of a big library association and someone else. And I still remember Steve Potash just totally full of passion, waving an iPad in the face of the other people on the panel saying, like, this is not a science experiment. This is real. <laughs> Yeah. And it's one of those things where if you're on the, I'm, I'm not, I'm going to try and circle into something coherent here, but if you're on the technology side of things, it's really obvious what the potential is for these things. And you see them, you see them as good and you see them as opportunities. This is the future that, you know, the future of publishing is going to include print, but aren't we lucky to live at a time when all of a sudden we've got all these other things we can do, like download texts, read them on screens, uh, you know, have the whole world available through one channel to sell books to. I mean, you know, but, but, but there's this other side of things, which to this day reacts with total dismay and incomprehension and, um, uh, you know, retaliation to these <laughs> things that people on the tech side, these opportunities, but actually, and so, but one thing I really want, cause this is going to become something we talk about, uh, later on in the interview, but I'm really glad you went into such precise detail about the misreading of Steve Jobs' statement, mm. or the misunderstanding, because this is a real, a really serious problem in the world of book publishing data reporting. Um, people get shit wrong all the time. And yep. it, it is very frustrating when you're in the industry and you, you know, you've got a bit of a, you've got a bit of a data and analysis mindset uh, to see like the New York Times and the Washington Post and the New Yorker and Vox and everybody get it wrong all the time. And the Authors Guild and I could go and, you know, <laughs> like there's, there's an organization in the UK, which I forget, but like people get it wrong all the time. They get it wrong in very basic ways. And there's just this inherent issue around data and analysis, not only with book publishing, but with libraries and things like that, that I'm sure we're going to get into in just a few minutes. Um, <laughs> but just just carrying on. Uh, and so after you, uh, you had all this like pretty sophisticated experience with the cutting edge stuff, 
uh, and this is not to contrast it with what you then went into, but then you went to work for a company called Media Source and you worked on a library journal. Yeah, so Library Journal and School Library Journal are kind of the the main trade journals for the library profession. Um, so if you think of, you know, every profession has its trade media, some better than others. Um, so the what's what's interesting is some people would see that as oh that's a weird. Um, at, at best, maybe sidestep. At worst, maybe a step back. What was interesting about and Media Source, uh, I don't even want to use that name. It, that was the shell. That was the name of the holding company that acquired Library Journal and School Library Journal, and they also owned the Horn Book and Junior Library Guild. So, what I and LinkedIn just makes it difficult to <laughs> uh, name the company because technically I work for Library Journal, School Library Journal, and the Horn Book. Um, what was interesting about them, and I so I moved over to them after the second year of Digital Book World. The Digital Book World was starting to head into more of an event-only model than I was uh, interested in. Like, I enjoy events as being part of my platform. I didn't, at that point, have any interest in being an event-only guy. And there was also some you know, other events that were going to come on our plate that didn't drive revenue for us, but we were going to be responsible for. So I didn't want to deal with that. So the the move over to Library Journal, just for shorthand, we'll just refer to it as Library Journal, um, was appealing for two reasons. Uh, between those first two years of digital book world, I started to learn a lot more about libraries and their place in the overall publishing ecosystem, and particularly their place uh, in the ebook ecosystem, which at that point was more or less an afterthought. 2011, um, neither... Macmillan and I think it was Simon and Schuster. Neither of them were even making their ebooks available to libraries yet at that point. So the getting libraries on the agenda for the second year of digital book world was kind of a personal challenge of, hey, I think this is important. Through that process, I met uh, some people at Library Journal, started working more closely with them, and originally with the goal of making libraries a little more central to the digital book world platform going into year three. Um, ultimately, what ended up happening is I just went to work for them directly. What was fascinating ab- about that uh, business was, A, librarians are a fascinating community. You know, there, there's a handful of professions in the world that most people, you know, give a high level of respect, even if they don't know a lot about what they do. Teachers and librarians are two of those. Um Librarians, you know, at their heart are, you know, information specialists. Their thing is, you know, the frictionless sharing of information to make us all better, smarter citizens. Books are obviously a big part of their brand. Their relationships with publishers are a big deal. So moving over to them was a more of an opportunity to work on a much more diversified uh, business model. You know, they were historically print magazines thankfully paid subscription print magazines and not uh, what's called controlled circulation, which a lot of business to business magazines are free to the subscriber based on their qualifications, which in an ideal world, oh, you're the CEO of a tech company. Yes, you're a qualified subscriber, Um, but you're still getting it for free. So the value you place on that uh, magazine and that content is probably a little less than the librarian who either directly or through their library is paying a hundred bucks a year for that. Um, so at that point they were already working on, they had done their first ebook summit, which was an online conference uh, specifically focused on the challenges of ebooks in the library space. So they had done that in October of 2010 between the first and second digital book worlds. So they were already starting to kind of play in that space. You know, Overdrive was the big player, but at that point there were a number of other startups playing with different models. Uh, this was before Overdrive kind of really ate the ebook world on the library side completely. Um, but what was really cool about moving to them was A, it really fit what I personally like about marketing, which is working with a brand that I can personally respect, that serves a community that I have a particular interest and respect for, um, and has either, if not already a diversified uh, business model, has the opportunity to do it. 
So through Library Journal, you know, we had the magazines, but we had live and virtual events. We had free and paid webinars. We launched online education a couple of years in. It was to this day, I look back on it, honestly, as my favorite job. It's it's the job that kind of made me sick of book publishers and pretty close to saying, you know what, I don't think I ever want to work in book publishing again. Um, and when I left them, I kind of thought, I was not coming back. I went to work in uh, travel media with North Star Travel. But the, the transition, I actually got to learn a side of the publishing business that most people don't know a lot about, which is libraries. Libraries are, you know, I'd say at best taken for granted. You know, most people see them as a cultural good. Um, almost every author has, um, you know, nice backstory about how the library helped nurture their uh, becoming an avid reader or in some cases nurtured their writing skills uh, by giving them access to information. Libraries are such a critical part of the publishing ecosystem, but to your point about data and you know the media's inability to get data and analysis right, libraries are the least understood and least measured side of the business as well. So those four and a half years there were personally fulfilling from getting to do the kinds of marketing things I really like in a community I really respect. But from a publishing perspective, I got to see aspects of the publishing industry that I wouldn't have seen uh, if I was in a more, on the more traditional side, either you know while I was at Writer's Digest or working for a book publisher or working for a wholesaler or a bookstore. Yeah. And uh, one of those th- interesting features of the book publishing industry and its relationship to libraries is that it, it is, um, in some senses, commonly adversarial, um, uh, which is probably people who are in the library space probably sort of laughing at the <laughs> statement that is. Um, you've, you've got a line in a recent post uh, on your blog where you talk about uh, antagonizing the one partner whose core mission is effectively expanding and nurturing the audiences for your products for free is a bad strategy. Um, and I think I think um, I'm going to enjoy talking with you a little bit about that the nature <laughs> of that relationship and and some of the things that have been happening recently, like the controversy with Macmillan, um, who did eventually start lending to libraries, but to this day hasn't figured it out. Um, just to set the stage a little bit, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the mission of libraries is and what some of the technological challenges are. And just you know, set this. I'm not an expert in this, but um, I have a little bit of an academic background, and so I've spent a lot of time in in um, research libraries. Uh, And some of the challenges, you know, just going back starting, let's say 25 years ago, when digitization started to happen, it took the form of um, one one thing that people started doing was putting digitizing data onto laser discs. Hmm. Uh, But then that turned out to be not such a good idea, because they were locked (laughs) into a proprietary technology um, that can expire or change. Um, Libraries, uh, one of their one of the things they're tasked with doing is preserving things uh and so preserve the 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 very it's a very deep technological challenge Mm -hmm. uh discs decay servers decay uh bits flip when radiation comes in to the machine um what format do you choose to save things in how do you how do you make it searchable um Things like that, but then let let let's sort of like you know put put all that to to the to the side. As huge an issue as all of that stuff is, lending is a really is what libraries do, and there are particular challenges with eBooks. And so I was wondering if you could talk about that and some of your experience with seeing like the interaction between libraries and publishers as they started working this relationship out, which is still still hugely problematic and difficult. Yeah, so uh, so two caveats to start. Um, I uh, by no means position myself as an expert on libraries broadly. Um, and one thing I commonly see librarians themselves say when they're speaking on behalf of libraries is most librarians will also um, set the caveat of, I can only speak from my experience. And I say that because sometimes when we talk about libraries, similar to when we talk about publishing, there's this broad uh, sense of what that word means, but libraries aren't one thing. So, A, you know, there's academic libraries, public libraries, and uh, school libraries, three distinct segments that other than being libraries and broadly sharing a mission of access to information, 
their their business models, the way they're funded, the way they interact with their communities, the partners they work with, all very different across the board. And even an individual publisher will work with those three communities very differently. Terms aren't the same, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so for the purposes of this conversation, I'm going to mainly focus on public libraries, um, partly because public libraries, school libraries uh, are really important, but are probably the most under attack by, you know, let's call them market forces. School librarians are continually being let go. School libraries are being downsized. Um, so they're facing challenges that really have nothing to do with publishers and Ironically, in a, is serving the audience that's probably keeping commercial publishing afloat, which is kids. You know, you look at the latest numbers for 2019, kids' books are up, adult books are down. So, and if, you know, if po po uh, politics fatigue has set in. So, even the big best selling political books of 2018 didn't uh, carry over into 2019. So, from a public library perspective, you've got a couple of things. So when we talk about publishing, you know, there's the big five, there's big mid-sized publishers like Scholastic, uh, Workman, Sourcebooks, and then you've got this huge bottom of the period, small and mid, you know, hundreds, thousands of small and mid-sized publishers that are actually rarely ever factored into these conversations when we talk about publishing. Libraries are similar. There's there are public libraries which, at their core, all have the same fundamental mission, which is uh, access to information for their communities. And what that translates into from an acquisitions perspective, collections, you know, the, the physical and digital content they acquire, books, magazines, newspapers, databases, all those things, um, that's going to vary community by community. So a New York public library, a Multnomah County library, a Nashville public library, those are big library systems that are uh, their needs, their budgets, the way they interact with their communities are going to be very different from, say, my local uh, library here in Bloomfield, New Jersey, who doesn't even have their own ebook program. They're part of a statewide cooperative uh, consortium that uh, buys ebooks, and then the various library systems that are in that consortium get access through that access point. So that's one of the first points about libraries that most people don't understand when they talk about publishers and libraries. And John Sargent kind of ran up against this, you know, face first, most recently with their new terms. He talked to some big libraries, he talked to some small libraries, and what he ultimately found was there is no one solution that's going to make them all happy, so we're just going to do this. And we know it's going to piss some of these guys off, we think it's going to make some of these guys happy. But that was a, um, a core example of there is no single example of what a public library is like. So from a publisher perspective, um, most big, all the big publishers have dedicated library marketing departments, which that in itself tells you something about the importance of libraries. Most big publishers don't have uh, dedicated sales reps for local independent booksellers anymore. A lot of them got rid of their field reps over the years. So, but meanwhile, libraries still have this dedicated marketing group in a lot of the big publishers. And, but what's not there is trying to find the right analogy for it. So thinking about libraries is like lumping Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all of your favorite indie booksellers together and saying bookstores, if that uh, makes sense. Got it. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. And thank you very much for sharing like all that information in precisely that way because getting a sense that like it's very complicated and it's not – there's no comprehensive understanding that maybe any one person can have is actually a really important thing to understand about this. And, and it is part of the reason that the reporting on these things is often wrong because people want to use a term like libraries and, you know, give the impression that by saying that word, it's well, this is, <laughs> this is well, a well understood unitary, you know, sort of self identical thing, but right. actually there are lots of different things going on with life. There are lots of like internally to the library space, but then the way the rest of the world interacts with libraries depends on the type of interaction that the you know on both sides and one of the really interesting tensions in understanding libraries and how they work is that libraries often have a kind of public mission especially specifically public libraries publishing companies have a private mission which is to make make a profit yeah. um 
And uh, it's one of the things that makes it an inherently difficult sort of multidimensional space to understand. I interviewed someone for this podcast a while ago named Rebecca Giblin. I don't know if you've heard of her. She's she's a professor at Monash University in, in Australia. She's got huh. something called the eLending Project, um, where what she's tried, she's led this project where people are trying, they're just trying to figure out how many books from different publishers are being lent out and in what way by mm. Australian libraries. And one of the biggest challenges she faced was getting, as I, if I recall it correctly, was not getting buy-in so much from the libraries, but getting buy-in from the publishing companies to share their information because yep. they're competitive capitalist organizations that are trying to make money. And um, the idea of selling something to someone for money that is going to be lent to someone else for free just has all these inherent problematic things. And you, mm -hmm. you mentioned John Sargent. So John Sargent is the CEO of Macmillan, uh, right. which is one, one of the big five publishing companies. And you're talking about a very specific uh, controversy that happened recently. Um, so they, they had released a press release saying that they were, yeah, they were going to, they were, you know, introducing yet another innovation into e-lending. Um, and this was going to involve only giving a library one copy of an ebook to lend when it was in the eight weeks, I think, when it's a new release. Right. And so that ebook can only be lent to one person at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, and since it takes usually takes a couple of weeks to read a book, that means, you know, every library is like maybe four people are going to get to read this book within the first eight weeks. Um, and I mean, there's all kinds of things we could talk about there when it comes to the lending models. They're really complicated. They're always changing. I imagine it's probably like on a library to library basis. Sometimes these things need to be figured out. Books can have time bombs in them where like you can, you're allowed to lend this ebook for two years or 20 reads and stuff like that. And it's just like this incredibly complicated area, but I wanted to zero in on before we talk about the uh, Panorama project, um, which we'll get to uh, shortly, um, just zeroing in on the nature of one of the reasons this Macmillan thing is such a big deal um, is, is this inherent tension between lending things for as it were for free although often people pay for their library cards and you know stuff like that and they pay taxes that go into funding these institutions but sergeant had a, a line in there that really struck me in it in his press release where he said uh he talks about the active marketing by various parties parties to turn purchasers into borrowers did you catch that at the time i found yeah. that that really stood out to me because it what, I, like just to put it in cartoonish terms, this was kind of top hat Mr. Monopoly in his New York power <laughs> going, there's like basically a communist plot out there to turn people into like, you know, communal owners rather than personal owners. Yeah. So that's that line struck you as well. Yeah, yeah. And so what's been interesting about Sargent is he's he uses a lot of outliers as his examples to prove that there's a problem. Um, and he kind of has to because he won't release any of the data that he claims proves that there's a problem. So the idea of libraries marketing their services to their community is free, you know, on its face, I get what he's saying. But A, there's two huge assumptions there. A, nothing's free. People in the community pay taxes that fund that library, that then that library takes that funding and pays publishers or through distributors, pay, publishers get paid. And on the ebook side, a lot more than consumers are paying for those books under these onerous terms that limit their ability to lend them out. Um, but people in the community understand that, all right, the library is not free. Because you know when they definitely understand it, when it comes on a referendum or a bill that says, hey, we're going to raise property taxes a penny, or we're going to do X to build a new library. So the, the idea that people, that library patrons think that libraries are doing something for free, and that means, hey, I don't have to shop at Barnes & Noble anymore. The other flaw in that assumption is it assumes that people are changing their behavior from well, I used to be a Barnes & Noble shopper or I used to be an Amazon shopper, but now that the library makes these things available for free, in quotes, I'm going to shift my uh, purchasing behavior over there. There's no evidence for that. There's probably, I'd say, some small truth to it. 
the for me the pushback there becomes well a if you're not willing to share data then we're talking about hypotheticals so that to me is the fundamental problem with this conversation is your refusal to share the data that you claimed uh, pushed you to this decision at least share, not sharing it in good faith with the partners who you are saying, hey, you're causing us a problem and here's how we're going to solve it. If you can't even share that data with them, A, they're not really partners at that point. Like, let's stop saying you love libraries because you're not yeah, negotiating in good faith there. But if you take that data off the table, well, let's look at the other assumptions you're making. You're making an assumption that libraries alone are um, eating away at your consumer sales. Not the expensive prices of your consumer ebooks, where often on Amazon it is very clearly cheaper to buy the print book. So, if anybody's shifting consumer behavior, it's your pricing model that you fought for, won through agency pricing, and have full control over. You know, so if you're seeing a decline in ebook sales and you believe people are going to the library instead, that's a business model problem. Tweak your pricing, and. So his, his secondary claim was, well, we, you know, everybody's raising their prices on libraries. We didn't want to do that. We wanted to find another way. So the other lever was uh, uh, availability. And it, this is the point where the whole logic falls apart, because if you truly see libraries as a partner that you respect, then you probably have a bare minimum understanding of their core mission. And two of their foundational principles are privacy and access. So by you saying, oh, we were in conversations with libraries and we decided this embargo model is going to be good for libraries, you are shooting one of their core principles right in the face by saying, we know you believe in access. You're just going to have to wait eight weeks for you to fulfill that part of your mission. Now, you can have a whole philosophical debate over, is that the right place for libraries to draw the line? Who knows, but it's where they draw the line. You know? So if this is a valued partner that you claim, making that decision and saying that it was the, it's partly for the benefit of libraries, to me was where Sargent kind of shot himself in the foot where he could have just raised prices like everybody else and nobody would have skipped. They would have complained, but there wouldn't have been these massive PR pushes to get communities engaged. There wouldn't have been a number of big library systems boycotting. They would have done what they've always done. They would have taken it on the chin and figured out how to spread their budget around accordingly. So there was a real miscalculation that came from a fundamental misunderstanding, A, of what libraries value most in their mission, and B, this assumption that consumer behavior is as simple as, oh, well, I'll just go to the library. Yeah, he, uh, in the in, uh, again, there's so many, so many threads to unpack there because I everything you say is so so densely densely put and well well formulated but um in in this press release i mean sergeant made it i mean as you say like there's you he's the ceo of a company he's got responsibilities to his employees he's got responsibilities to his customers he's got responsibilities to his shareholders you know th this is a very serious and important and not not i mean from not necessarily an inherently bad kind of project to be engaged in mm -hmm. I'm part of a i'm part of a capitalist enterprise myself uh <laughs> but when you go and say sarcastic things, um, I'm, I've actually got the press release open here, but he says like, basically like, turns out, oh yeah, it seems that give up, I'm just quoting here. And again, it's, it's sort of remarkable because he made it personal, right? Uh, he goes, it seems that given a choice between a, pur a purchase of an ebook for twelve ninety nine or a frictionless lend for free, just dipping with sarcasm he says the american ebook reader is starting to lean is starting to lean heavily toward free and it's just like the as you as you point out in some of your and you pointed out in a, an article you had in publishers weekly recently there are 16,000 public libraries in the united states they have a 1.5 billion dollar acquisition budget a lot of that is going to publishing companies uh to start getting all sarcastic about the, the fundamental nature of what a library exists for in a press release not only betrays kind of like a kind of ideological adversarial thing, but like I said, something sort of personal, uh, you know, that, that, that made it, uh, you know, much more complex than just, as you say, if it had just been a matter of sort of straight up money, people would have adapted like they have in the past. But when you sort of 
go around attacking the the fundamental mission of a library. Yeah. Uh, you're, you know, how can you not expect people to start talking about boycotting, boycotting you? Uh, and what, again, like I, this is, it's a bit in the weeds, but like, what world are you living in? Who are you surrounding yourself with where no one told you, like, don't, don't right. do this. <laughs> Just don't do this. Uh, but anyway, so like, I mean, I guess we're going to, uh, this is probably a really good opportunity. So there's this, isn't, the library space is multidimensional. It's very complicated. It's got lots of people on all kinds of sides with all kinds of interests interested in it. There's this inherent kind of um, dark matter nature to some of the information in, involved in it because a there's so many different libraries doing so many different things for so many different reasons in so many different ways, but they're interacting with the private competitive companies that don't want to release information. And so skipping over your time at Writer's Digest, you're now the project lead at something called the Panorama Project, uh, which is trying to address uh, some of these fundamental and very complicated issues. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the origin of the Panorama Project and what it's what it exists for and uh, why you got involved. Yeah, so the Panorama Project uh, was first conceived in 2018. Um, Steve Potash and Overdrive uh, had convened a few other industry members, I think somewhat from seeing the writing on the wall, you know, that uh, new term publishers were all in the process of developing new terms that would roll out in late 2018 into 2019. Um, and what was missing was data. You know, at that point, uh, Macmillan had already initiated its tour experiment where they windowed new releases from their tour imprint, which is their sci-fi fantasy imprint. Um, and at, in that experiment, they did it for 16 weeks, four months. So for four months, libraries couldn't uh, acquire at all, not even of the one copy that the new uh, terms uh, introduced. They couldn't acquire any new tour books for the first 16 weeks. And so whatever discussions were happening there to implement that and the thinking behind it, um, Potash and a few other people in the industry started um, discussing ways to kind of um, address the problem. And the problem fundamentally was a lack of clarity around libraries' actual impact. You know, some publishers are saying libraries are having a negative impact. Some publishers aren't saying it, but are changing their terms in ways that suggest maybe they think that. Other publishers, you know, are happily working with libraries and not introducing onerous terms. There, At the heart of it was a lack of data to say, is anybody, you know, somebody's right, who is it? So the initial uh, conception of the Panorama Project was very much a data-driven initiative. The goal was to, similar to what you mentioned about the e-lending project in Australia, um, was to gather data from multiple publishers, multiple vendors, in, and do analysis to really try and measure the impact of library availability. Um, it was primarily focused on ebooks at that point because that's where the data was accessible because Overdrive dominates that side of the market so much. Um, and they were willing to make that data available. What they found was publishers were either reluctant or unable to aggregate and share the kind of data that would be required to do any real effective research. So while they were kind of working through those kinks, trying to figure it out, um, they were able to conduct a few title level experiments that at least anecdotally showed, hey, it, given a focused marketing effort centered around libraries, where you're actually making the library freely available to everyone without restrictions for a limited period of time and all the promotion that comes around with that, not only was there a positive impact on ebook sales, there was a positive impact on print sales as well, both in libraries and on the consumer side. Granted, those were anecdotal uh, initiatives that uh, had a heavy marketing element attached to it, which the message to me there is, hey, you know what? If you're better at marketing, you can improve sales on your books. Like, <laughs> that's the heart of that message to me. But um, so at some point, there was a realization that the data-oriented uh, approach at best maybe was a longer-term thing. And what they really needed was more active um, engagement and advocacy on behalf of the project and the need for what the project was trying to do. 
So that in its beginning, Cliff Gurin was uh, the initial project lead. He's based Pacific Northwest. I want to say Seattle. I've never met him in person. Um, he was the initial project lead. One thing they were looking for was someone closer to New York who could, you know, at any point go into the city, meet directly with publishers. That's particularly difficult if you're coming from the West Coast. So, and I knew Steve over the years from, you know, my time at Digital Book World, my time at Library Journal. We stayed in touch off and on. And at that point was just as I was on the verge of leaving uh, Writer's Digest in the wake of F&W's bankruptcy, blah, blah, blah. So the timing was kind of perfect. Uh, you know, my background being more of a publicly outspoken figure, my proximity to New York, the desire to focus more on ad- advocacy and engagement kind of made me a good fit. And, you know, my personal interest in the space, my interest in data, marketing analysis, all those things made me a good fit for it. Initially, you know, I started last July and it was supposed to be a quiet summer in publishing as I eased my way in. And two weeks after I start, Macmillan's new terms are announced and everything blows up. And I've been kind of (laughs) running ever since. Yeah, that's that's really fascinating that that shift from uh, sort of a, a strict or a more strictly data focused thing to actual interactions. Um, and I think this is reflected in uh, some of the work you've been doing on what's called a reader's advisory. Yeah, so the reader's advisory committee, you know, I have to give Cliff and uh, the, the committee that's around that full credit for that. They that was one of the initiatives done uh, implemented during the first year. And what that was, was A, to there was a survey done of librarians to understand the various readers' advisory activities they do and don't do. And just as a quick definition, anyone who's familiar with uh, hand selling, you know, that's one of indie booksellers' hallmarks is, hey, they hand sell books. That's great. In the library world, that's called readers' advisory. The difference is that's an actual discipline libraries learn as part of getting their library degree. Um, and it's so it's not just, hey, uh, you're really into sci-fi. I'm really into sci-fi. You should read this latest book by X, Y, Z. It's it's a more grounded process that doesn't just rely on a per, on a librarian's individual interests, but actually works with their background in information science research, their familiarity with their collections. Um, so it's a, it's a much more in-depth version of hand selling. So the initial initiative that they worked on was building out this directory. You know, what are the different forms of readers' advisory? How do libraries implement it? What does it look like in the library? What does it look like outside of the library online? Um, And that was kind of a nascent effort to help publishers, but even, frankly, some librarians, to understand the marketing value that libraries deliver that, you know, isn't monetized in any way. These aren't co-op programs. You know, getting on the front shelf of a library isn't the same as getting on the front table at Barnes & Noble. You pay for that at Barnes & Noble. Libraries are making those decisions on their own based on their community's uh, needs and interests. So that Reader's Advisory uh, Survey and the directory that came out of it, that was the first wave. What I'm working on is a follow-up to that. Um, In that research, we found author events were a particularly potent part of that discovery mix. And out of that, we are starting to build um, a library marketing valuation toolkit that will actually um, give libraries a template that they can actually put a value on the various marketing initiatives they do and present that to publishers the same way a traditional media operation would present a media plan. So, hey, you know, perfect example, uh, Cuyahoga County Library outside of Cleveland. They do a number of uh, author events every year. They've got a good partnership with a local bookseller who handles the book sales. They're one of the models that gets used a lot for uh, author events in libraries that drive book sales. What was more interesting when they started to dig deeper they did an analysis of the marketing that they did for some of these events. And there was one author, I forget her name, um, not a major A-list author, but a perennial bestseller, solid, you know, um, book version of a character actor. You'd know the name if you heard it, even if you're not necessarily a fan of that author. Um, but anyway, they, she was doing a reading at the library and they measured the value of the various touch points that the marketing had in uh, all the in-branch promotion, email, website promotion. Cuyahoga has their own public access TV show. And what they got was they put market value 
on all of that locally targeted marketing. And it was basically about $15,000 if in the equivalent marketing, if a publisher had brought that author to that town, but put them in an event space, you know, outside of the library and had to do all that marketing themselves, that one event, there was about $15,000 in equivalent marketing attached to it, all about that author, which not only drove book sales at the event itself, but awareness of the author in the community, yada, yada, yada. So what's what's really important about that is your average mid-list author, you know, not, not your big bestseller who gets the big banners at BEA, but 95% of the books published by publishers, on average, they might be getting five to $10,000 marketing budgets. Most of that going to social marketing efforts, maybe email at the higher end, maybe they're going to get some ads in some key trade journals. Very few are getting the New York Times or New Yorker ad, anything like that. You know, so your, your American dirts that got like the full court press, those are your exceptions. Most of, your, most of these books are getting ten to 15, uh, five to $10,000 marketing budgets across the board, not specific to libraries, across the board. So if a single library can deliver $15,000 in marketing value for one author for one event, what are 16,000 libraries potentially delivering for publishers across the country for the various books that they're promoting into their communities? And is this specifically the, the, um, the library marketing valuation toolkit? Yes. Yeah. Right. And is this, is this something that people can, can download and use if, for any librarians listening, if you want to let people know how much value you're uh, giving to the community and the industry? Uh, not yet. We're still developing it. Uh, my goal is to have that uh, by late April. It should be available. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's just the work, the work that you're doing is just so important. And it, it's, inter it's just one of the things I found so fascinating researching for this interview was, you know, um, I mean, you, you point out in various places that there hasn't really been a lot of research done in the last five years on, on kind of all of this. Um, and at, although there are, you know, literally billions of dollars at stake and there are tens of thousands of organizations all over the place, we just don't, it's all a big black box. Yeah, what, what's fascinating to me is, um, as, as so because my initial background in marketing was not from the book side, I, I came to the book side of uh, publishing from the broader media side, the magazine world. As a general consumer, you know, I play video games. I'm an avid uh, movie fan. And, you know, as a kid, I was like fascinated by the USA Today's ratings charts, you know, box office mojo. I was kind of annoyed recently. They've uh, paywalled a lot of their box office data. Like I'm a geek for data. Book publishing is the most opaque media industry of them all, like bestseller lists are meaningless. You know, if mm -hmm. there are people running around calling themselves New York Times bestsellers because they hit the list once, maybe in the seventh spot, dropped off immediately, but they're a New York Times bestseller alongside Michelle Obama, whose book is still on the bestseller list. You know, and those no, those those rankings have no meaning because there's no numbers attached to it. So, given the time of year the number one New York Times bestseller might have sold 5,000 books, might have sold 50,000 books. The, that, that opaqueness is purposeful, I think. A, you know, Amazon drives a lot of that. Amazon refuses to give any data on anything unless it you know, serves their specific purposes. So there's a lack of transparency in the book publishing industry across the board when you compare it to other media. And then when you get into libraries, you know, now it's a black box inside a black box when it comes to figuring out libraries. Not so much on the ebook side because uh, Overdrive is reasonable. You know, as much as any company is willing to share data, Overdrive is reasonably willing to share data in ways that uh, an Amazon isn't. And because they're such a big part of the library ebook marketplace, their data on its own has some meaning where there's a complete lack of transparency, and it's, this isn't even uh, purposeful, I think it's structural, is on the print side. You know, libraries spend more of their budget still on print than they do digital, even though all this conversation is about digital. Um, but what, uh, what's a big unknown is, all right, you know how many copies they buy, or you can know, that's a knowable number that isn't typically reported anywhere. 
And it's one of the things I pointed out in the PW piece is let's start there. How much revenue do libraries actually drive, like directly? How much money are they putting in publishers' pockets through their direct purchases? Forget about you know perception of lost revenue from lending and stuff. Just off the bat, how much money is that? I, I've heard anecdotal numbers from companies as high as 10 percent to I'd say on average, I hear eight to 10 percent. Uh, is what libraries drive for a lot of the big publishers. Compare that to independent bookstores, which you know the, the narrative right now is you know they're they're resurging, they're coming back, they're such an important part of the ecosystem, and I personally believe that's true. Most publishers, they're they're three to five percent tops of their revenue, so their value is less about their revenue than it is about a it's a bulwark against Amazon. Because, you know, God forbid the day Amazon controls the market any more than they do, that becomes a challenge for publishers. So publishers value physical bookstores, you know, both Indies and Barnes and & Noble. And there's numbers that can be placed on that. Libraries, I'm pretty confident, represent a bigger percentage of publisher revenue than independent bookstores, partly because independent bookstores uh, are zero when it comes to ebooks. So the you know that side of the market, indie bookstores don't really play a role in, whereas libraries do, and it's been growing. So you look you look at you know the data that is kind of knowable. It's partly what has me say, you know what? If libraries are the problem in the way you see them, are they just a symptom of the actual problem, which is shifting consumer uh, behaviors and preferences? If you have, if Amazon has done a really good job of making eBooks the preferred format for a lot of people, and you've decided you want to charge more for those eBooks than your print books, you've made a business decision to prioritize one format over the other. Now the consumer gets to make their business decision to I can pay fifteen dollars for that eBook. I can go borrow it from the library. So if there is a shift in, if anybody is turning buyers into freers, <laughs> borrowers, you know, there's a more compelling argument that li- uh, publishers' pricing models for eBooks are what's doing that, not libraries successfully marketing themselves for doing what they've always done, making information accessible to their communities. Yeah, you're reminding me of a, a line, uh, Nate Hoffelder, uh, the you know, digital book reader, um, uh, blogger had a great line about the Macmillan thing where he said, I know that the legacy industry likes to tell itself comforting myths, but the idea that library ebooks affect ebook sales more than high retail e- ebook prices requires a unique level of denial. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it really gets, to, <laughs> really gets to the heart of it. Um, so, uh, just moving on to the next, the last part of the interview where we talk about the, uh, get to pick your brain about, you know, book publishing industry generally, maybe from 30,000 feet. Um, you mentioned you're a gamer. Uh, and one of the really interesting things about the book industry now is that there seems to be a little bit of a growing, this has always been true that, you know, there's been competition for time and eyeballs. Uh, but people seem to have a growing understanding that, um, or I think they do, maybe I'm wrong about this, that, you know, the books are competing with, with Netflix and with games and with all kinds of other things. Is, is this, is this something that the industry is having a reckoning with? Um, I think there's a reckoning happening that a lot of book publishers are unwilling to recognize or acknowledge. Um, I think there's still, by and large, book publishers uh, believe they live in this kind of rarefied cultural tastemaker space that personally I think is mythological. You know, I'm not old enough to say it never was true. Um I'm definitely old enough to say if it was ever true, it was for a very narrow segment of what we define as cultural. Um, but the whenever you talk to people in publishing, there's so so my daughter is a firm believer in the dessert stomach. No matter how full you are, there's always room for dessert. <laughs> Book publishers seem to have a version of that belief that no matter what's happening in other media, book people are book people. And there's always money for books when you're a book person. And while that's a that's a comforting belief, I think it's a myth. The you know, 
the reality is, you know, people's discretionary income has not grown significantly over the past couple of decades. The demands and uh, opportunities for them to spend their money in the digital space, you know, one of ebooks biggest problems in the early iPad days, and I don't know if you remember, you know, enhanced ebooks were going to be the next big thing. And anybody who was paying attention to the overall iPad ecosystem and what was happening in the app store is like, really? Your $19.99 enhanced ebook is going to compete with the 99 cent Angry Birds? I'm not sure that's realistic. Um, and that turned out to be the case. Like, ebooks could, you know, became, and even Apple stopped really paying attention to iBooks for years. It became an afterthought. They even they didn't even trot it out for several years in their big presentations, um, because where the money was was in games in the app store, and where it wasn't money, it was in attention with the social apps. Books became at best a third level uh, thing when it came to digital attention, and that's only increased over the years as you know the world has increasingly gone mobile. The the mobile experience has improved. Like I personally don't understand how people watch Netflix on their phones, but plenty of them do. You know, audiobooks and podcasts are a huge growth area, and audiobooks in particular for book publishers a huge growth area. That's that's where the revenue is really growing right now. Um, and there's no there's a sense uh, that that's a brand new audience, and I think there's some truth to that. I think there are definitely some people who are coming to audiobooks who were not previously big book readers. But I'm married to someone who was formerly a huge book reader who now 90% of her book reading is through audiobooks. And as a result, she never got into ebooks. She jumped from print to audio. So that's part of it when I talk about these changes in consumer behavior that haven't been measured. You know, that's so that's the other big initiative at Panorama we're undergoing is this immersive media and reading study that we're going to do um, in partnership with Portland State University is to not just look at book consumption, but look at books in the context of media overall. You know, how much of your time and as importantly, money is going to gaming? You know, I used to read a lot of ebooks. I'm spending more time watching Twitch or I'm more time on my Xbox or I've shifted my reading towards self-publishers. I don't think of them as self-publishers. I just think of them as, you know, there's these $2.99 books in Amazon and then there's $14.99 books. I just like sci-fi, so I'm going to read five of these $2.99 books and that $14.99 one, I'm going to go get at the library. Those are all uh, anecdotes of actual consumer behavior that I'm not going to pretend to say is 50% or 20%. So what my goal is, nobody's measured this in a while. A lot has changed over the past five years in consumer behavior, in where you can spend your money. You know, five years ago, people were still wondering if, the oh, Netflix, you're going to be HBO? Really? I don't know if that's going to work. Now Netflix is like, hey, yeah, our competition is Fortnite, not HBO. Right. You know, the world has dramatically changed. But if you live in the book world bubble, you know, what's changed is libraries. It's like, really? Come on. Speaking of the, the book world bubble, um, for those for those who don't know, um, the book publishing industry is controversy ridden. Um, <laughs> I think it I think it is surprising to people who don't follow it. But uh, it, we're living in a particularly controversy ridden time. Um, you mentioned American Dirt earlier. Anyone who's interested, I'll I'll post a link to your lengthy blog post about about that and and the, and, the, and, the, and the, the very important links in that to all the other you know important things that people have written about it. Uh, because it's a difficult one to wrap your head around if you're not sort of into it. But, you know, there's also been a controversy at the Romance Writers of America. Uh, there was a controversy with Hachette uh, just recently regarding Woody Woody Allen's book. Yep. Um, and I was just wondering, while well, we've got you here, um, and you mentioned earlier that you're you're outspoken, so I really want to take advantage <laughs> of the opportunity to ask you if you could talk about, not necessarily, of course, like, you know, go into the weeds about any particular controversy, but... What's what's the bigger picture here? Is there is there what's the what's the problem? Um, so, you know, publishing has a couple of problems. I think the one that is currently flaring up in the examples you're referencing is is at its heart. It's publishing's long term diversity problem. 
And that's not just racial diversity, that's diversity across the board. Um, but it's, you know, in the most recent examples, what you're seeing is, you know, the Hachette example, um, the Woody Allen memoir being published by the publisher of Ronan Farrow's uh, big Me Too expose that would primarily focus on Harvey Weinstein. Like the disconnect that a company would think, hey, yeah, this makes sense to publish this book when this was our big book of last year is representative of, you know, a, a version of, so there's the broad book world bubble where, you know, everybody in the book world lives in this bubble where books are the most important thing. And then within that book world bubble is a larger subset, which is, and the important books are first and foremost, the best sellers and best sellers are defined by our core audience, which, you know, most publishers We'll say this in different ways, but my favorite framing of this, uh, Aya de Leon uh, kind of, I, don't, I won't say she coined it, it's where I saw it, is it's the middle class white woman book club reader. That is corporate publishing's core demographic. And I want to be clear in corporate publishing versus, you know, what I mentioned earlier, you know, you've got the big five. Underneath them, you've got some significant mid-sized publishers. And then underneath them, you've got hundreds thousands of small and mid-sized publishers. That group down there, to me, is the future of publishing because those are publishers who are keyed in on specific communities, specific genres, specific niches. They're not worried about national bestsellers. They're more focused on selling to the audiences that they have connections to, whether that's regional connections, cultural connections, genre connections. But you get into this corporate publishing where you said yourself earlier, you know, there's that business aspect. Corporate publishing exists first and foremost to make money. Cultural gatekeeping is a byproduct of a legacy that they you know, like to have on their about page. But first and foremost, it's about uh, bestsellers. Secondary is let's win some awards, too. Like, that's nice. But first and foremost, push for the bestsellers. And so that push for a, be for a bestseller is A, partly defined by, well, what drives bestsellers? Amazon increasingly, but what drives that buzz that builds towards the bestseller that Amazon makes it easy to buy? Because Amazon doesn't create bestsellers. Amazon will perpetuate existing bestsellers. And if you are good at Amazon marketing, you might be able to piggyback and ride the uh, coattails of some of that activity. But, you know, bestsellers are created in the pre-publication process. The publicity machine that gets, you know, your book on Oprah's radar, that gets you first on the list at the various trade journals where you're definitely going to get a review versus maybe versus they're not even looking at your books. So there's this entire pre-publishing, uh, pre-publication machine that works in the big five's favor, first and foremost, because they're the big publishers. They've got the relationships, the levers to pull. You get on the big retailers' uh, radars. You, this is our big book. You get behind it with a big buy. Print runs determine, you know, advances in print runs determine, you know, the marketing push that's going to get behind a book. So by the time a book hits the bestseller, so much has happened that really the big five are the only ones who can, you know, manipulates the wrong word, have access to the levers to kind of create that pre-publication buzz to land on the bestseller list week one. And so by definition, you're looking at these trade journals, these retail outlets who cater to a specific subset of the reading audience. And corporate publishing has built their business model around first and foremost, serving that core audience and everything else, regardless of the size or potential, becomes niche. So, you know, there's a lot of conversation about diversity. You know, I firmly believe that in a country that I think is estimated to be 50 percent minority majority in like 10 years, but at the kids level is already past that. Like you, you look at under 18. Oh, that's a really great point. Yeah. United States is already minority majority. I was at Pub West um, a couple of weeks ago out in Portland, Oregon, and Andrew Proctor of uh, Literary Arts, it's a or, uh, literary organization out in Portland that serves, it's a statewide organization. And one of the analyses they did 
was because they were having this challenge of evolving their model to serve a broader audience. And he made a great point. He's like, well, if you just look at the data, well, Portland is only 12 and a half percent people of color. So, you know, there's not much we can do for that small an audience. It's like, but then we dug into that data and I think he said 40 percent of kids under 18 in Portland were people of color. And suddenly you, you now are looking at your audience very differently. Big publishing has that same challenge. If you define your core audience by your his, what historically drives a bestseller, you're going to continue to feed that beast. You're going to publish five times as many books into that channel because all it takes is one big hit. And, you know, PRH, you know, much to some employee's chagrin, a few years back, they all got their bonus because of the success of Shades of Grey. Not not the literary masterpiece that won the National Book Award, but the allegedly lowbrow, originally self-published book that put money in every PRH's employee's uh, pocket that year because it was so successful. So publishers are driven by this bestseller model that prioritizes feeding that beast and everything else becomes niche. So the I wrote recently about uh, The Witcher. So... Uh, Netflix just did the um, their series based on the novels. It's the I think the, the novels. There's eight of them that have been translated into English. Modest seller on the book side. A huge gaming franchise though. Uh, the Witcher Three sold 20 million copies in its first two years of release. Name a book that sold 20 million copies in its first two years of release. You can't. It would have come to mind immediately if it existed because there would have been 50 press releases about it. And we you, becoming Michelle Obama, I think, sold 1.8 million copies. So but The Witcher was perceived as a niche IP by NPD when they did their book scan analysis for the impact of the Netflix show on the novels. So a franchise with 20 million sales of one uh, edition of the game in a category that has a behemoth like Fortnite, which in 2018 brought in more revenue than all but two of the big five on its own, that one gaming franchise. But books, the book world looks at those categories as niches. Romance is a niche. You know, not to you know uh, be generic and say only women read romance, but the U.S. is more than 50% women. How are you going to say romance, which is, if not the biggest genre category. It's, it's the second biggest, poss possibly only behind thrillers. It's dismissed as a niche. So there are these huge categories of readers who are perceived as niche by big publishers because they don't fit that, what they consider a core demographic, the, the middle class white woman and book clubs. You know, it's really, it's re thank you for sharing all that, by the way. That's, there's so much to, to think about there. Um, uh, one thing that you're calling to my mind is there's something really interesting because you made a point earlier about how people often think some things are generational that aren't like computers, um, you know, and there's something about, I guess I, I don't have, I've been trying to put my finger on it for a long time and I don't have it and this isn't going to be quite right, but there's kind of the book world gaze um, where computers are seen as this like interloper that might just go away soon, <laughs> um, you know, and, and there's like, I mentioned, you know, John Sargent getting all um, sort of personal and sarcastic about free versus paid and and there's something i was just i was just reading a new york times article by, by you know i think a millennial um saying you know characterizing working from home as being like people kind of you know sitting around in their sweatpants and eating snacks and I'm, I'm trying to put something together here that there's something there's something about a kind of mindset um that seems i don't know if it's kind of institutionalized or what but it looks at things like diversity as like a fad Mm -hmm. It looks at things like computers as like a fad. And so there you can have people who are, you know, like you said, like, you know, The Witcher 3 sold 20 million copies. The, the, the video game world is bigger than the book world, as big as it is, uh, at, at least in some dimensions of the book world. Uh, I think it's bigger than movies. Um, and yet you've got people who sort of set themselves up as being kind of hard-nosed, watching the demo types, and they've just got these giant blind spots yep and yeah i don't i i guess I, I don't know what else to kind of say about it except it's this it's this very weird 
weird phenomenon and it's not it's not unique to people of any particular age to just dismiss these very serious things that are happening that are really happening in our world as uh as passing fads yeah it's i mean you know i compare it to and i i hate this framing because it's kind of reductive but it was ultimately effective you know it a few years back when um, in the U.S. gay marriage was finally uh, gaining steam and was starting to be legalized in several states, what ultimately tipped the scales in a lot of states was the economic rationale was like, look, if you legalize this, that's a whole bunch of people getting married, spending money, weddings are expensive, all the things that come with that. And people who were fundamentally against it at least could understand the economic rationale. And suddenly it became, okay, I may be against it, but I can see why it should be allowed. And for some reason, publishing has never quite been able to turn that corner when it comes to all these categories it considers niche, all these audiences that, you know, so many authors have stories of, oh, yeah, this is a really good book. We just don't think there's a market for it. Self-publishing has kind of been built on traditional publishing's blind spots for what they believe there is and isn't a market for. So when you think about, you know, all these categories of readers who are not well served by traditional publishers um, or are, to your point, fad, you know, all right, you know what, we're, we're going to publish this one book. Eh, it didn't do that great. I guess there's no opportunity there. Meanwhile, how many failed book club you know, attempts hit the remainder pile? But as long as, you know, if you publish 100 of them, all it takes is two to really be hits. But when it comes to other categories of readers, you don't get that kind of long-term thinking and investment. You get the, this, we're going to give it this one shot and it better be exceptional. Otherwise, there's clearly no market here. So it's kind of that same, you know, you can either prioritize a particular market and invest and go after it, or you can play the fad game and say, well, you know, we published two Latinx authors and, you know, they weren't bestsellers, so we don't think there's an audience there. It's like, well, you weren't, you're not invested in that audience. You just threw two books out there, especially knowing what publishers spend to market books that aren't their A-list books. So there's there's a business model challenge. I think there's a traditional blind spot to who publishers believe their core audience is and the business decisions that kind of trickle down from you know it starts there like if this is who you think your core audience is all of your business decisions that follow are going to be through that lens and anything else any other audience then becomes an exception no matter what somebody might be able to show you the opportunity is you can't see it because you're so focused here well, uh, Guy, thank you very much for sharing so many uh, really amazing insights into so many different different things. Uh, I, we've reached we've reached feature length uh, in our interview, <laughs> so I think that might be. They would, I, it, you know, we could I think talk for a long time. I could certainly listen to you talk about these things for for a lot longer. But um, I think in in the interest of our audience and and, and of course your <laughs> own your own evening, I should probably let you go. But yes, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, for taking the time for do this and for, for do this uh, interview and for sharing so much, uh, for anyone interested in the Panorama Panorama Project, it's at panoramaproject.org, and you should definitely follow Guy at G LeCharles on Twitter. All right, appreciate it, Lynn. Thanks a lot. Thanks. And thanks, as always, to all of you for listening to this episode of the Front Matter Podcast. If you like what you heard, please rate and review it wherever you found it. And if you'd like to be a Lean Pub author, please check out our website at leanpub.com. Thanks.